Welcome back on The Pulse. Thank you for staying. Let's get into news about the scourge of pregnancies in school. Now, there's growing concern among educationists about the sudden rise in the number of girls who return to school pregnant after the 10-month COVID-19 shutdown of schools. In a recent report released by the GES, more than 109,000 girls were found to have taken seed during the period, with nearly 3,000 of them between the ages of 10 and 14. More than 107,000 were between 15 and 19 years old. This afternoon, we're focusing attention on the Upper West Region, where 694 girls have been found to be pregnant. We have a conversation with our correspondents on this shortly, and we're also going to speak to officials of an NGO, Educational Resources, which is looking at sexual harassment generally in schools. First, though, we interact with uh, Rafiq Salam, all the way from WA. Uh, Rafiq also joining uh, us now is uh, Kojo Brumpong, Executive Director, Educational Resources. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for joining the conversation. But Rafiq, uh, even before I get to our guest, paint the picture for us. What is the reality and uh, how much does this reveal, basically, about pregnancies in schools? In, in, in... I can barely hear you. Rafiq, so my question is, on Hello? the back of... Can you hear me now, Rafiq Salam? Hello. So I think what we're going to do is we're going to uh, try to work again uh, that connection with Rafiq Salam so we can have a better uh, connection. Uh, Rafiq, can you hear me now? Is it better? Well, I think we still do not have uh, Rafiq, so we'll move on to Edward. Uh, now, Edward, basically, on the back of what we have heard, your group is trying to uh, put forward measures to make even more concrete sexual harassment and other you know, measures to be uh, brought to bear against those uh, you know, engaging in this activity, impregnating the young ones. Uh, what can you share about that uh, with us? Hello. Uh, Hello. We, we, can you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear. Please go on. Good. Um, we are educational resources. We know that one of the issues in adolescent development is engaging in sexual activities. It's, it's a reality many of us try to desist from talking about, but there's always peer pressure to experiment with sex at that age. So there's, there's, there's always a need to actually educate the young ones about the challenges with early sexual experimentations. And that's why we at Educational Resources, we go into the schools to mentor the children and then interact with them, and especially encourage them to desist from sexual experimentation. We, don't, we have to understand that as a society, many parents do not have conversations about sex with their children. And so most of these children, they, what they know about sex comes from their peers. They, so there's, there's a huge peer pressure to engage in adult-like activities. And it is the main reason for the cause of these pregnancies that happened out of school. We believe that if there's more education in schools about sex, it would help to minimize such occurrence. Right. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, initial submission, Edward. Let's try to reconnect with uh, Rafiq Salam to give us uh, more details about this. Rafiq, can you hear me now? Hello, Rafiq. Is, is the line, is the connection better now? Can you hear uh, what I'm saying? Well, we still have a challenge uh, with Rafiq Salam, but we're going to continue working the lines to ensure that we can reach him because we need further details about this development and what measures are being put in place to stem the tide of saying. Uh, is that Rafiq I hear now? Well, I think we still have a challenge. Let, let me come back to Edward. So uh, you have started this initiative uh, in the schools. What so far have been uh, the gains that you have made? Uh, what have you been able to achieve so far as far as this situation is concerned? Because year in, year out, we face uh, the same situation. Well, the gains are hard to quantify because you are talking, you are dealing with 
trying to mold attitudes so you don't get instant gains. But we believe in the long run, a lot more of these teenagers would not experiment in sex. So this is basically the education. We make them understand early sexual experimentation is also associated with high risk behavior because if you can engage in sex at the age of 13, 14, 15, the probability is that you might also engage in other high risk activities. So we, we have what we call mentoring sessions with the children. And then for those who have peculiar challenges, we try to find ways to help them. So Edward, if I may ask, uh, is your target group only the, the young ones? Because if you look at the dynamics of the situation, uh, on the back of COVID-19, we've heard of how some uh, incestuous activities have taken place. Sometimes even relatives have impregnated some of these schoolgirls. Uh, we've had situations where uh, people from school themselves have been involved. So is it just the students you are targeting? Beyond that, what happens to the, the real perpetrators when it comes to the men involved? Are you looking at them as well? Okay, so it's not just the school children we are targeting because we, are, we, we want the school environment to be safe. So it's not just the school children. It includes everyone who works in the school environment. And that is why we recently issued a communique that education service, the ministry should actually do more to actually provide guidance to students and teachers alike and all workers within the school environment to reorient them, to give them more education on sexual activities and sexual abuse. Because there have been incidents where some adults or some teachers or some workers within the school environment actually are the ones who abuse these young ones or engage in these sexual activities with these young ones. So the, the rich is not focused only on the children, but on everybody who works in the school environment. But more importantly, we believe that if we can give the right education to the younger ones, then they can actually report advances made towards them. They can report sexual advances. And then they can actually be in a, uh, in a position to also resist those who make such advances towards them. Let's not forget that in our society, we sometimes, sometimes forget to listen to the voice of the children. So we want to empower the children to be able to speak up. And the more they speak up, the more we can get such activities to go down. Right before I cross over to uh, Rafiq Salam, I'd just like to put this to you. Do you feel we need uh, stiffer measures, policies maybe, in our educational setup when it comes to sexual harassment and maybe teachers who impregnate such school children do you feel we we need that we we, we need definitely we need that when it comes when it comes to sexual harassment we need extremely stiff punishments so that we can deter people from even trying to engage in it otherwise you find yourself in a scenario where a, a, a student a people a, a young person is being harassed by an older person. Who do you report it to? Give, let me give you a scenario. What about if it is, the, let's say, the head of the school harassing a young person? There are no, there's no avenue for them to report such issues. So we believe that the ministry and the Ghana Education Service should outline sexual harassment policy. Yes, they have a code of conduct where they talk about sexual harassment, sexual violence. But we believe that they need a singular document on sexual harassment and not just need a document but the teachers should be retrained and the children as well so that both parties can report advances when it starts we don't want it to happen before it happens, they report it we want that when they start making the advances the children should be able to report and the punitive measures should be taken against those who try let, let me interact now with uh, Rafiq Salam. Rafiq, if you can hear me, just let me uh, know. And please unmute uh, so we can hear what your response would be. I just want to confirm that you can hear me, Rafiq Salam. Can you hear me, Rafiq? Uh, please unmute. Yes, uh, please unmute. So I can hear you saying loud and clear, but please unmute so we can actually hear you. 
Hello? Okay, so I, I, I figure Rafiq Salam is still struggling to hear me. Rafiq, if you, you are close to any uh, television set, uh, hopefully not too close, uh, all I'm trying to say is that unmute so we can actually connect with you. Hello? Right. It's, it's better now, now, now that we have you on phone. Now, what we heard earlier was what happened uh, to our, our girls when schools were closed down on the back of COVID-19. Uh, that figure of close to 700 is a great worry. Uh, w what have been the reactions uh, so far uh, as far as this issue of close to 700 girls getting pregnant in schools on the back of COVID-19 is concerned? Uh, in the upper West region here, the people woke up to the news about the nearly 700 uh, pupils uh, who became uh, pregnant during the era of COVID. Uh, it's not a welcome news. It's not uh, good news. Uh, that the people would like uh, to hear. Uh, but speaking to uh, some people in the Upper West region, uh, they are not really surprised about the number of uh, uh, girls uh, who were pregnant during the, uh, that particular period. But what they are surprised is about uh, the numbers. I have spoken to some non-governmental organizations uh, on the issue, and they also peg the number of uh, uh, pupils or girls uh, who are pregnant differently. I, one has to be with the chief executive officer of life again, and they pick the number to about uh, 4,000. Uh, and so in that post, it's really a warning uh, development. Uh, because when COVID came, uh, it was part of the issue because many of the girls in the post region, because school was not in session, some even went to uh, illegal mining, they went to Gelam State side, and even some traveled to the southern Gulf of the country in search of non existent uh, jobs. And so the people of the post region, most of them are not really surprised about the number of girls that are, are pregnant uh, during that uh, era. But what they are surprised mm -hmm. is about the figures that are being turned out by the Ghana education system. So very high figures. I am curious, and I'm sure our viewers are curious as well, to find out what exactly is happening to these girls. Are they facing stigmati stigmatization, I should say? And how are the communities accommodating them? I know that sometimes these girls, through no fault of theirs, you know, get into this situation, yet they are ostracized and all of that. What is happening to, to those you've interacted with? Um, majority of them, uh, they are, what will their parents do? Because uh, even I, I spoke to uh, one of the girls who told me that even the guy who uh, got her pregnant is even uh, denying. And so as hard as uh, her parents are trying uh, to talk to this guy to even accept the pregnancy, but accept responsibility but he wouldn't uh, budge and so uh, some of the parents they have for now they think that they have to live life again without uh, these uh, uh, so-called boyfriends or, or people who impregnated uh, their daughter so it's really a war uh, development and so one of them I spoke to is even still, uh, still pregnant at the moment and then she's hoping to deliver uh, in the next uh, two months and but the guy uh, who is alleged to have impregnated uh, is still at the night. And so it's a war in development. And so most communities, um, some, somewhere along the line, it's a norm. Uh, because uh, the only bad aspect of it is that they will think that if you are pregnant, you don't need not to go to school again. And so um, society largely is not also trusting them, but at least they are learning, learning to live with them. And, and that indeed is a crucial point you make there with regard to what happens to a lot of these schoolgirls whose educational trajectory may be curtailed. But I, I, I'd like to find out, the men uh, who are involved, if later confirmed, what happens to them in these communities? Um, you know, uh, in the Upper West Region, I've always said that uh, the one stumbling block or one major hurdle uh, as far as uh, trying to fight crime in the Upper West Region has to be with this subculture of the people referred to here as the Jabungini, meaning we are all one. Because the people in the Upper West Region, majority of the people are not uh, litigants, and so most cases are settled out of court. So I wouldn't be surprised if uh, these cases that we are talking about, the nearly 700 uh, girls that we are talking about, most of them, they would like, uh, or they would prefer to settle it out of the court settlement. They would like to like, do community uh, settlement, which is really an affront to fighting a uh, crime in the Upper West Region. And so um, most of them, few of them uh, may go to court, 
But I, I can tell you that the majority of them uh, will be solved at the family level. Uh, finally, Rafiq, uh, I'd like to find out from the standpoint of the Ghana Education Service, we were just deliberating, I together with Edward, about maybe stiffer penalties for people, men, uh, who may impregnate uh, teenagers in, in, in this way. Uh, what, what is the GES doing in terms of sexual harassment, among others? Stiffer penalties may be uh, to clamp down on this matter. If you've had any interactions with the GES, uh, uh, what have they been sharing with you? Um, the GES over the years, they have gotten uh, some positive uh, measures involved, especially one, it has to deal with a teacher uh, who uh, somewhere uh, impregnates a, 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 a girl. But in the case of the larger society, when the person is not a teacher, but it's somebody from the community, the GS, I don't think that have that, uh, uh, that uh, the, the GF doesn't have that strength, that uh, doesn't have that way without uh, to at least uh, get hold of these kids. So most of these cases are dealt at the community level. But if it comes to teachers, these years they have gotten penalty measures uh, are involved. But when it comes to community people, yes, their hands are tied when it comes to those issues. Uh, Mr. Brumpong, so finally, to, to wrap on this conversation, what are you looking forward to uh, seeing happen maybe within the next uh, few months to stem the tide of these happenings? Uh, we've seen them year in and year out. Can you hear me? Okay, I'm off. Um, we believe that education always reduces such incidents. Let's not forget that at that young age, it's for them, they do not know, the, a lot of them do not fully understand the consequences. So they need a lot more education. So over the next few months, we are always calling on people to come on board to let us educate our children about sex, about sex and their sexuality and why they do not need to engage in such activities. Within the school environment, <clears throat> sex is spoken about undertones, but everybody, when they come back home, nobody talks about sex. In the school, when they go to school, they discuss sex among themselves. And yet parents are afraid. So we want to call on parents, community, everybody gets your hand, not everybody mm -hmm. on board. Sex education is vital for the development of our adolescents. We need to be brave about it. We need to talk about it so that they can get a fuller understanding and that would make them not engage in such experimentation. So we are calling for more education for the younger ones and then a, a, a comprehensive policy on sexual harassment from the ministry and from the Ghana Education Center. Mr. Brumpong, thank you very much for engaging us uh, on The Pulse. Kojo Brumpong is Executive You're Director. Welcome educational resources. We also have joining us uh, my colleague uh, Rafiq Salam all the way from uh, WAH.